So it's a great pleasure now to introduce our first keynote speaker of the morning, who is Claudia Baranzelli. Many of you know Claudia because she's from the, the, the DG Joint Research Center, and she's going to make a presentation on the territorial reference scenario uh, for the future of Europe. Please join me in welcoming Claudia. Claudia, the floor is yours. Thank you, Greg. I apologize in advance for my voice. I hope it's still intelligible today. So let's hope. Well, um, I'll start. Um, OK. So today, uh, with this presentation, I would like to share with you um, what is, uh, really briefly, the contribution of the Joint Research Center to the territorial agenda. As you may or may not know, um, our uh, modeling platform called LUISA is explicitly mentioned together with ESPON in the tool number 33 of the Better Regulation Toolbox of the European Commission. So today I'll speak not only about scenario-based projections, but I'll try to briefly explain you also how we get there. So what is the territorial knowledge uh, base that is behind mentioning a few example of uh, historical analysis. And if time allows, uh, I'll also um, briefly mention our dissemination strategies for the data and the analysis that we produce. So let's start from some definitions. So what's a territorial reference scenario? Um, it can be understood as a baseline scenarios, so sort of benchmark against which we can compare different alternative scenarios or alternative policy options. It assumes the most likely socioeconomic trends, and this is really, really important because this is a tool that is used by several policy DGs in Brussels. So we have to agree with them. Um, and uh, we take on board the European Commission assumptions on future economic and demographic uh, outlook. Amongst uh, several sources, one of the most important ones is the ECFIN Aging Report. And the few examples that you see in this presentation, they all refer to the latest available Aging Report. Actually, just a week or so ago, um, we got the news that ECFIN finalized the new um, economic and demographic outlook. So now we are already starting to update our reference scenario uh, in the coming, uh, which will be available in the coming uh, months. We take on board also the expected uh, effect of European <laughs> policies which have a known territorial uh, dimension. Um, cohesion policies, the CAP for the agricultural sector, TNT for transport, and so on and so forth. And in this way, we are able to capture and to analyze the cross-sectoral impacts and interaction between different policies at different um, uh, spatial scale, as uh, we'll see uh, in a minute. In order to get to these uh, um, results, we have to rely on a rather vast underpinning knowledge base, which is composed by two main components. On one hand, we have a regional socioeconomic database, which cover both um, historical uh, and historical period and projections. These are economic variables and indicators such as GDP or employment. Depending on the indicator, the data date back to uh, 1980s until today, and then projections up to uh, normally 2030, in some cases 2050. The second component of the knowledge base is um, I would say humongous geographical database, which uh, gives us information on where economic activities are located, where services are present across the territory, morphological information about the territorial, uh, the European uh, territory, etc. And all these, uh, the reference scenario in its default configuration, it's updated on an yearly basis in order to take on board major updates. Um, just to give you some examples of um, input, uh, uh, input data that is behind our approach. We have a very nice representation of a social infrastructure distribution across Europe, so the exact uh, geographic location of where, for, where, for instance, uh, hospitals or schools are located. Um, we have a very accurate uh, uh, representation of transport infrastructure for both road and uh, um, railways. 
Uh, same goes for the energy infrastructure. Uh, lately, we have been investing a bit more time in uh, collecting and harmonizing data on buildings and households at municipal and sub-municipal level whenever possible. And as I mentioned before, long time series of socioeconomic uh, parameters. We are also trying to complement these uh, traditional data sources with crowdsourced and big data. Uh, yesterday, uh, this topic was, uh, was briefly mentioned. Uh, and we go from uh, very high resolution satellite imagery to personal weather stations that we use uh, to monitor the um, uh, microclimate uh, in urban areas, social media, and of course all the services that Google makes at disposal. So why, uh, why do we need all these, all these tools? I'm, I'm sorry that the titles are cut from the slides because they are an integral part of the presentation, but I'll, I'll do my best. Um, because as we all know, uh, European regions are widely, widely diverse. And so uh, if we want to assess the local and regional impacts of European policies in a meaningful way, we do have to take into account that physical features, socioeconomic, demographic and environmental characteristics are all specific to their location and their regional context. So we have to be able to work across different spatial scales from the very local one up to, uh, up to the national scale. Uh, here I have just a um, simple example, uh, a um, straightforward example to exemplify this concept of working across different dimensions, but uh, I will not uh, spend time here. What we're looking is basically uh, for the coming 10 years, the expected um, population changes across Europe at national, and that's two level, and that's three level, down to um, the geographical location of the changes which I'm not seeing in the presentation. Um, I need some technical assistance. <laughs> what All you right. right. All right. All right. Sorry. Um, so um, in order um, to um, make use uh, to all these uh, um, all these tools that we have at disposal. In the last year, we have dedicated uh, quite some time to analyze major uh, European trends, looking at both historical, um, historical periods and uh, um, projections, reference projections. And uh, we have dedicated quite some time to the analysis of determinants of regional and urban growth. Uh, we have been looking at regional competitiveness. We're really interested in demography and urbanization, and of course also quality of life, for which we have developed uh, both a regional and uh, urban indicator. Starting from uh, determinant of uh, growth, um, if we look at the past uh, 10 years um, of data, so from 2000 to 2040, again it was in the title, but. It got cut. Um, we can indeed identify few uh, variables uh, that can explain 80% uh, uh, of the variance that we have in our data, um, such as initial uh, GDP per capita, share of working population with different education attainments, and so on uh, and so forth. And uh, of course, we can also concentrate a bit more on the um, effect uh, of specific variables. And for instance, if we think about spatial spillovers, we can indeed map uh, GDP growth um, uh, at regional level across Europe and clearly identify two big clusters of regions with either high or low growth. Um, in the first case, neighboring regions self-reinforce their growth. In the second case, they negatively affect their reciprocal um, growth. And uh, when we talk about competitiveness, uh, again, we can select few key variables, uh, such as employment shares, GDP per capita, or young uh, dependency ratio, and analyze the past uh, 10 years of data to, uh, to see how changes evolved. So starting from 2000, going to 2005, we can identify across Europe a general upward development trends. So low and medium competitiveness regions tend to improve their performance. Um, 
until 2010, uh, this upward trend continues, but uh, slowing down, until 2014, when the negative impacts of the economic downturns are clearly visible. And uh, this is another example that we have been working on, um, analyzing the role of cities in the economic, uh, economic growth. Here, the main message is that uh, not all metropolitan regions are equal. So whether we consider capital, second tier, or smaller metro regions, uh, the behavior is quite different. And this has uh, important policy implication because one, uh, a, a kind of one size fits all um, of policy will not, uh, uh, will not work. Um, so far, we have been talking about uh, historical trends, historical data. Um, here we're looking at uh, uh, projections, so again, the coming 15, uh, uh, 15 years. And yet again, if you look at demographic changes across Europe, it becomes clear that uh, location, uh, location matters. For instance, not uh, all cities across Europe behave in the same way, but for instance, depending whether they are located in core regions or peripheral regions, they behave rather differently, losing or gaining uh, population. And this has important repercussions if we want to assess the effectiveness of um, European policies. Think, for instance, uh, the investments in infrastructures. Um, there, their main objective is to increase potential accessibility of the entire European territory. But in order to do so, we cannot just consider the amount of money that is invested in the physical infrastructures. We do have to take into account how population distribution will likely change uh, in the future. Otherwise, we will provide a biased, uh, uh, biased uh, outcome and uh, results. And of course, once we have set our reference scenario, it becomes really interesting to play with alternatives, with uh, um, policy options. Here we're looking at uh, an example that uh, DG Regio asked us to work on, a um, convergence scenario based on the hypothesis that GDP per capita and productivity will converge in the, uh, in the long uh, term. And uh, of course, we can design uh, alternative policy options also keeping in mind specific uh, performances or specific uh, topics such as the quality of life in cities. And here we are looking at an example on the air quality and level of population exposed to a pollutants concentration levels above the legal limits. So here it becomes really uh, interesting to play um, and to combine different technological assumptions, different um, um, likely um, population or uh, urbanization patterns, and then understand what could be the potential role of, for instance, local planning instruments in order to counteract or better to um, ameliorate the performance of cities, for instance, regarding uh, air quality and uh, quality of life. So as I, as I promised, I'll conclude my presentation mentioning uh, um, how we disseminate uh, data and the output of our analysis. So far, um, we have developed two main web platforms. One, the territorial dashboard, is dedicated to uh, regional data, meaning from uh, NATS 0, so from country level down to NATS 3 level. And the urban uh, data platform, which is uh, instead dedicated to uh, disseminate data on cities, different aggregation levels, so cities, metropolitan areas of different types, and so on and so forth. In both cases, we provide mapping tools and interactive charts that any user can download and use. And of course, the, um, the actual data behind can as well be downloaded. Uh, we have now plans to merge these two platforms in one, and we also have ongoing uh, talks with other uh, commission services, such as Eurostat, uh, to investigate the possibility of uh, um, interlinking our respective platforms in order to provide one uh, consistent service to, uh, to our users, which are, uh, of course, any type of stakeholders, policymakers, and of course also um, the citizens. So I invite you to um, explore uh, the data and the analysis that we make available through uh, these platforms. Please download the data and, if you wish, uh, give us your feedback. Thank you.